Caleb set this up, didn't you, Caleb? It's for Caleb Height. Well, that's my brother back, back there. It's my first time using a microphone, Caleb, so speak into the microphones. <laughs> We, uh, we thought there might be a, a slightly larger crowd than usual, so yes, I'm under strict orders from Caleb to uh, enunciate and project, so <laughs> thank you, thank you, Caleb. <laughs> yes, he does, he does, he does do a good job. And, uh, and I should mention, too, that Caleb does all of the, the filming for our lecture series and then all the editing. Uh, my my skill set does not extend in any way in that direction. And, uh, and then we put it, all of the lectures are in full on our website. And we have a YouTube channel, which is again, Caleb, Caleb made. Well done, Caleb. That would be beyond me. Yes, thank you, Caleb. <laughs> The, the technical support. <laughs> All right, I have so many things in my pocket, so I make sure I have the right one, remote, yes. Um, so welcome this evening. Uh, this is our first uh, lecture in this lecture series on French art. I think French art is winning. I've been doing Italian art for the last few months, and look at the crowd for French art. We might have to stick with French art for a while. <laughs> And, uh, and this evening, as, as I mean, you're here, I was going to say, this evening we'll be talking about the Notre Dame. You know this because you know, yes, obviously you're here because you know it's about the Notre Dame. And, uh, and we decided to do a, a lecture on, on this topic because, of course, there, uh, there was the fire on April, the, April 15th, and, uh, and the, the spire has been lost, and the, the roof as well. But the majority of the building uh, has, has remained intact. And I won't talk a whole lot about the fire tonight. We'll be talking about the, the building itself and, and why you've probably heard in the news over and over again about, about the Notre Dame being a fine example of French Gothic architecture. And I thought, what is that? Nobody would know what that even means. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll talk about that and what it means to be a good example of, of French Gothic architecture. And, what is this Gothic idea and what does it even mean? And, and then you'll know, you'll be looking and you'll be seeing all the things and you'll be just like Caleb. Caleb points out, he knows now that every time we're traveling, he has to point out that it's this type of architecture and this type of architecture because if he doesn't preempt me, then I'll, I'll launch into the lecture. So <laughs> I'm a joy to travel with people. And I also want to say that uh, tonight's uh, lecture is generously supported by uh, Bernard and Elizabeth uh, Cormier. So thank you very much to, to Bernard and Elizabeth. Uh, I think everyone has a, has a connection. We'll talk about this too, that everyone has a connection to the Notre Dame. Everyone has, has seen it. More people go to see the Notre Dame than go to see the Eiffel Tower. I would pick the Notre Dame. Come on, Gothic architecture over the, the Eiffel Tower. Uh, but Bernie, Bernie was telling me about his first time uh, seeing the Notre Dame when he was 18. So I think it's it's one of those one of those uh, uh, art moments or kind of moments in art history where where we all have these memories of of interacting with these with these uh, uh, buildings and these these spaces. So thank you to Bernie and Elizabeth. So I apologize for the, the light. We have these big windows, which are great, but it's really terrible for art history lectures. And just so you know as well, that as we progress through the summer and the evenings get lighter and lighter, our lectures will be getting lighter and lighter. <laughs> so we started at 6.30 in the evening uh, in the dead of winter, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be getting lighter and lighter. Eventually it'll be 9.30. We'll have, maybe we'll have like a late night art history session. Wouldn't that be actually kind of fun if we did that? So, so what I'd like to begin is uh, by, by providing you with, with some context, because uh, our history, what makes uh, a building or a structure or an art object or a painting, what makes art historians pay attention to those objects or what, why we would choose those objects to, to write about or to study or to include in art history books, it's, it's those art objects that fit into the art historical narrative. So they're never seen in isolation. That's always the problem when, when we're expected to go into the Louvre and we stand in front of the Mona Lisa and we're expected to, to feel something. Don't you know you're in the presence of great art? And no, it doesn't work like that. Like it's not this kind of magical, intuitive moment. We can probably feel something. We feel something when we go to see the Notre Dame. We know that it's, it's important and it's beautiful. But it's, it's within a broader context, a broader art historical context that makes it, uh, that makes it relevant, it makes it important. So 
We're backing up about 300 years. I'll cover it in 20 minutes. So bear with me. <laughs> so I'd like to talk about uh, uh, the, the popularity of the pilgrimage and what impact that had on Europe and the architectural style of, uh, of the Middle Ages. The millennium, not Y2K, this is the 1-2K, 1, no, 1, 1, K, right? Whatever, you know what I mean. Uh, the 1K, yeah, <laughs> the 1,000, what, what, uh, what that meant. And, and then the precursor to the Gothic, which is uh, the Romanesque uh, architecture. Because I think you have to know, again, what comes before Gothic to understand what makes the Gothic really, really cool. So we'll, we'll talk about that. I know you can't, you can't see all the little details here. But I have a couple maps to, to show you uh, kind of what was, what was happening around the year 1000. And uh, this is kind of in the, the middle, the middle of the Middle Ages, the middle of the medieval period. And everybody was worried. They were worried about the year 1000, just like we were worried about the year 2000. We thought the internet was going to break. Uh, they thought the world was going to break. They thought it was going to be the second coming of, uh, of Christ. And so starting around 950 BCE, there was a, a, a building frenzy. So, so, so religious communities were trying to uh, build structures and build religious monuments that would affirm their faith, would be a symbol of their faith to, to the community and to God. And then individuals were embarking on uh, the pilgrimage. And, and that's when the, the, the idea of, of being a pilgrim and embarking, say, for instance, to, to Jerusalem or to other important religious sites became a thing because it was something you could say, you know, when, when Jesus arrives for the second coming and, you know, you want to be on the good side. We'll talk about what side is the good side, right and left. But you want to be on the good side of Christ when he arrives and sending a whole bunch of people down to hell and taking the good ones up to heaven. And, and if you went on a pilgrimage, you say, look, I was that pilgrim. I did a thing. I'm a... My, my soul is, is pure. Um, and you've probably, uh, people still go on uh, these, these pilgrimage routes, which I think is really neat. You're walking on this trail that has been walked on for a thousand years. The, the most famous, oh, so, so Jerusalem. Jerusalem was like the ultimate, I mean, if you were a real dedicated Christian, you would, you would head off to Jerusalem. But I mean, that's long and uh, complicated to get to Jerusalem. Uh, even more so in the Middle Ages. So a much easier destination for, for the pilgrims was the, the uh, Santiago de Compostela, which you've probably heard of, the Camino, uh, Camino de Santiago. You probably know people who have uh, gone on this pilgrimage. There's a few people from St. John. Uh, one of my former yoga instructors <laughs> has done it. So I had a professor at Queens who would do it uh, quite often. If you're, uh, if you're really ambitious, you start in France. I think those are the serious pilgrims. You, they always tell you, well, I started in France. Where did you start? Anyway, the, the, the less committed pilgrims start in Spain. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. They're committed also. But you have to walk. There's a minimum distance you have to walk. You know, you have to do 40 kilometers or something or other to be considered a true pilgrim. And then you get your name read at the, at the mass. So you can see the, the, the pilgrimage routes, they're, they're, they snake all over. This is just for, for the, the Camino de Santiago, but they snake all over France. And of course, the, the pilgrims, they're, they're on foot. Uh, so they can travel only so many kilometers a day, probably say 20 kilometers if, they're, if their feet are healthy. So, so they would have to stop. At, at little towns and, and little villages along the way. Oh, here's an image of the, I think it's a very romantic image of the pilgrimage. I think it just sounds very hot and like a lot of work to me, but <laughs> it's never really appealed. My mom suggested all the time, we should go on a pilgrimage. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, I don't know. So this is, a, I think this is a great example of a, of a, of a town along the pilgrimage route. Uh, this is in Conque in, in the, the south uh, part of France. I can, I can never find it on the, you know what, that's too hard to see. Anyway, it's down, it's down in here somewhere on the, on the route. I don't like this. <sighs> there we go. Maybe I'll hold it. No, it's not going to do anything. Uh, whatever. I'll survive. So, so you can imagine the... The, uh, 
the enterprising people of, of the town of Conk, uh, realizing that this stream of pilgrims were, were coming into their town uh, pre-year 1000, and even after, I should say this, even after the year 1000, when the apocalypse didn't happen in 1000, they thought, well, it must be 1033, because Jesus died when he was 33 years old. So 1033 was the big year also. And then when nothing happened in 1033, uh, they said, well, we've been really good. We did lots of pilgrimages, so, so God has spared us this time. Uh, so, so, so these towns had thousands of pilgrims uh, streaming into them. And, and you can imagine businesses popping up. And I mean, just like, like now on the, the Camino de Santiago, there's all kinds of hostels and, and, and restaurants and things like designed for the pilgrims, get a pilgrim discount. So we've been, we've been entrepreneurs, right? Caleb, Caleb's like, yes, that sounds good. Yes, pilgrimage discount. <laughs> um, uh, setting up along the, along the, the pilgrimage route. And then also, uh, churches uh, began to, to spring up, and, and, and an, architectural, um, an architectural style coalesced, and it was one of the first uh, international or European-wide style since, since antiquity, so since the Roman Empire, because the, uh, Europe had been uh, disjointed in the, in the early Middle Ages. But because the pilgrims were traveling throughout Europe, there were ideas about how buildings should be built and how they should be structured were spreading across Europe because of these uh, pilgrim trails and also because of the Crusades. I don't talk much about the Crusades, but the Crusades also were, were spreading some ideas about and this, this is an example of the Romanesque, uh, a Romanesque church, which I'll, I'll explain in just a few minutes what that, what that exactly means. But again, the enterprising people uh, connected with the Abbey Church of, uh, of St. Foy. There also has sprung up the, the cult of the relic. So if you could take advantage of those pilgrims, those thousands of pilgrims that are on their way to Santiago de Compostela, if you could hold them in your town or hold them in your church for a while and separate them somehow from their money, wouldn't that be great? So, so again, these enterprising uh, uh, church, church people, uh, abbots and, and monks, uh, realize the, the power of the idea behind a, a relic. And a relic is... Um, Oh, a chunk of a saint or a venerated person. No, I shouldn't say a chunk. That, that diminishes it. It's actually a very important part of the Catholic faith. But it's a, it's a bit and bob of, of, of a person. Um, sometimes it'll be, you know, a knuckle bone or an entire arm or uh, the skull. Oh, if you get a skull, if you get a skull of a saint, that's a good one. Saint Foy, they have a skull. And, uh, and so they would... They would encase this relic uh, within what's called a reliquary, which was often very, very uh, decorative. You can see here that this is the, this is the one at St. Foy. And, and pilgrims then, so they would form many pilgrimages to these, uh, these smaller churches along the way. And, and they would, they would uh, venerate the, the relic, and then good things might happen. So you might get healed, produce miraculous healing. And actually, Oh, this is a great story. This isn't really relevant, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, Saint Foy. So the uh, Saint Foy was a, a child martyr. Uh, she was she was killed for her her Christian faith. This is in the late Roman uh, Empire, and uh, and so she she was she was venerated as a as a saint uh, for dying for her for her faith. And she was actually her remains were stored stored were held at uh, stored. That's horrible. Uh, were held at a, at a nearby town. So not in Conk, but. The, 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 the church, the abbot and the monks at, at the Conk church thought, we really need a relic. We need a good one. Boy, that kid martyr over there, she's getting a lot of traffic. We should go get her. So they steal her. They steal her remains <laughs> and bring her to the abbey in, uh, in Conk. And of course, the neighboring town is very upset. Well, we want her back. She's much happier in our town. But then, I mean, maybe this is true. Maybe it's not true. But the, the monks at the, the new church of St. Foy claimed that there were all kinds of miracles. So the relic was working all kinds of miracles in her new home. So she was obviously much happier 
in her new spot, so she is staying. So that's where she still is today at, uh, at the, 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 here, she's here. The poor other little town, I wonder what they, what they have left. Maybe they could, no, I was gonna say they could split her up, but that'd be terrible. Uh, <laughs> So there, there also emerged a, a black market of, uh, of dealing in, in these, these, uh, these relics. Because, of course, I mean, in the Middle Ages, how do you prove that this is, that this is the skull of St. Mark? How do you prove that this is the knuckle bone of, of St. James? So it was, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was complicated, right? Like what was, what was real and what wasn't real. But it was about mysticism and faith and... And again, the miraculous things were happening in these in these churches in these spaces, and uh, and and again, like I, I'm I'm kind of making fun of it, but it's actually it is a very very important part of, of the Catholic faith. And the the relics at I don't know why I'm pointing here that's not Notre Dame, but the relics at Notre Dame were among the first things uh, that the that the people of the church saved uh, from from the space. So it was very important relics uh, in Notre Dame, and they were they were rescued first. Uh, Again, then on another lighthearted note about the kind of the black market. And again, if you don't know if, if like if, because it could be anybody's skull, right? Like it could be could be anybody's skull. Uh, there's a great scene if you want to watch a watch something about Gothic architecture. There's a BBC uh, miniseries about uh, based on Ken Follett's Pillars of the Earth, and uh, you might have I'm hearing some affirmative. <laughs> you might have seen it, uh, but there's this great scene, and I think it's so. Um, it's so plausible, and, and again, kind of speaks to the enterprising nature of these medieval, medieval churches. Um, there's a, a fire, and something collapses in the church, and they have a skull of, of some saint, and the skull gets crushed, and that is the source of their income, right? Pilgrims are coming to the church, and they're donating. Oh, they get healed, there's a miracle, and then they shell out all of their money. I'm like, what are we going to do? We don't have a skull anymore. It's been, it's been crushed. And there's this wonderful scene where the abbot goes down into the crypt, and he's surrounded by skulls. And he looks around and he picks one up. He's like, okay. And he brings that up and pops that into the <laughs> pops it into the reliquary. So again, that's a, a fictionalized account, but you can imagine uh, something something similar happening. Uh, very entrepreneurial. Again, Caleb's nodding. He's like the abbots. Yes, that sounds that sounds good. Good uh, good good business practices. Yeah, who needs, who needs business case studies, Caleb? Who needs to talk about that when you can just look at uh, medieval, medieval uh, uh, abbeys? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, yeah, so, so Romanesque architecture. Um, back, to, back to this. Uh, so this is the facade uh, of, of the St. Foy in Conque. And, and there are a few features of, of, of Romanesque architecture that, that you should note. You can always pick out the Romanesque because they have, it's, well, I should tell you why it's called Romanesque. Uh, Romanesque, it's in the style of the Romans. And they were, they were starting to look back to the architecture of Rome. And of course, Roman architecture, if you think of Roman aqueducts and the triumphal arches, it's all based around the idea of the arch, the rounded arch. And, and they thought that was a good idea. Charlemagne really liked that idea. And so Romanesque architecture, it's very, all of these rounded arches throughout I'll come back to that. Uh, but the problem with, with, with the arch, it's a very elegant uh, architectural system. So it looks, it looks really nice. The arch is very, very beautiful. But there is uh, arches, the, the pressure is downward and outward. So it, it has a tendency to splay. So Romanesque churches had to be buttressed. So they're not flying buttresses yet. We're not quite there yet. But they had to be buttressed with thick, thick walls to support this, this arch. So that's, that's what you see here. The walls of Romanesque churches are very, it feels very heavy. It feels like a, a dark, heavy space, kind of rooted, uh, rooted to the ground. And because the walls had to be so thick, the windows are small. So very small windows in Romanesque architecture. The design, this will look familiar. We've all been in churches like this. This is the, the popular form of the church. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's to manage traffic flow. <laughs> so this is the, it's a cruciform uh, plan. So this is the, uh, the shape of a crucifix. And uh, the, the parishioners and the pilgrims would enter here. And the, 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 the faithful, the regular faithful, the parishioners of the church would be in the main nave 
facing the altar, and the pilgrims who were coming and uh, parting with their money, right? They would go up the side aisles and in around the ambulatory, and there would be individual chapels, and there would be a relic in each chapel, and then probably a little box where you could put your money in, plop, 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 plop. And then they would come back down the aisle on the other side and come out, and they would leave the parishioners alone traffic control. And we've all done it. Again, if you visit the Notre Dame, you go in and you're funneled up one side and you go round and round and round and then they funnel you out the side. And there's often the nave will be blocked off because they don't want you to interfere with the, the uh, yeah, the, the, the parishioners, the, the people who, uh, who attend uh, Notre Dame or these other cathedrals for their, for their faith. Traffic control. So barrel vault, we have the arch, rounded arch. Ignore, don't look at this one yet. We'll come back to that. I should have cut that off. It's a spoiler. So this is the inside of, uh, of St. Foy. Notice the, the roundness of the arches here. Quite small windows. Again, you've probably seen lots of pictures of Notre Dame. We'll get to Notre Dame. The big, enormous, enormous uh, colorful windows. We're not quite there yet heavy, heavy columns, not much decoration. Uh, this is the exterior. No, no flying buttresses yet, so the buttresses are connected to the church itself. So heavy, heavy, solid, connected to the ground. You can feel gravity in, in these churches. <coughs> oh, this is a bit of a... Is it connected? It is connected. We'll, we'll say it's relevant. So um, this is the, this is the, the entrance uh, of, of the, the, the Abbey Church at, at St. Foy. And there's always, oh, there's always good bits. If you're going in and out of a church anywhere, if it's a Romanesque or Gothic church, so especially in France and England, don't let the crowds herd you through the entrance because there is good stuff. There is good stuff above the door. I know, and it often has to do with uh, the Last Judgment. That's a very popular imagery as, you're, as they're funneling out the door. So it's, uh, it's the church's way to uh, remind its parishioners to behave until you get to church next time. And I know this looks quite busy, but I'll break it down just a bit. So here's uh, church, uh, Christ in the center. And recall that I said about being on the good side, you want to be on the good side of Christ. If you've been to some of my, well, if you've been to the Bosch lecture I did <laughs> earlier uh, this year, we talked a lot about the, the good side and the, the bad side. So the, the right side, dextra, is good, and Christ is always rising, raising the, the blessed with his right hand to heaven. And if you're left-handed, oh, that's bad. That's... <laughs> He's always casting down the, uh, the, the damned with his left hands, the sinistra, sinister, right? That's the root of the word, uh, um, uh, the little Latin sinistra for left. So hell is always on Christ's left, and heaven is always on Christ's right. And whoever the sculptors were at Conk, they had a great imagination. I love the depiction of hell here. Look at the mouth of hell. And do I have a detail? Yeah, here it is. And there's the, uh, an especially flamboyant demon. He has a bat, and he's cramming in the damned into the mouth of hell, and they're popping out the other side. I don't know where the rest of the creature is, but they're popping out the other side to come face to face with, uh, with the devil. And then Christ is on the next, uh, the next level up. He's the largest figure. So the, 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 the key to understanding uh, uh, medieval art, or kind of the, the idea behind medieval art, is that they were, they were communicating a relatively new religion, right? Christianity had, had, had not been around as long as some of the, the more antique religions, right? So they had to communicate to the illiterate masses what was important about the, the Christian narrative. So they make it really obvious. So the most important figure is always the biggest. You need to understand what, the, what the, big, the big person is doing. So Christ is always largest. They're not so concerned with uh, realism or realistic details. We talked about the Renaissance in, uh, in some of the other lectures. So the, the attention to, or the interest in human anatomy kind of falls by the wayside. And they're more concerned with the, 
the narrative uh, behind the uh, it, what needs to be communicated. They're breaking down the narrative into the most simple elements. So that's why the heads are, are tend to be uh, larger than life. The the uh, the kind of the realism of the anatomy has uh, fallen by the wayside. It's not it's not so relevant to the to the narrative. There's Peter with his key. I think I've joked about this in previous lectures. Peter, uh, Christ gives Peter the keys to heaven, and Peter is always lugging around a giant key in everything. You can always pick out Peter, and all of the architecture and the, the decoration at St. Peter's is loaded up with keys because they want you to know that they're the ones with the keys. So, of course, it's, you know, two feet. Wow, this key. Oh, and here's a, I had a detail of, of hell. Oh, it's great. Look at that. I think we may do just a whole thing about hell. Maybe I, did, I do that sometimes for my university students to keep them entertained. As a, we, compare, we compare versions of, of hell. And uh, medieval, Romanesque and, and Gothic um, uh, sculptural approach is about filling every nook and cranny so you can spend you can spend hours and hours wandering around uh, a Romanesque or, or a Gothic cathedral looking at all of the little uh, minute details because they fill they fill all of the spaces here oh and then the two demons roasting a uh, roasting somebody over <laughs> the fire yeah. Oh, and here's the, the figure cramming with his, with his mallet, bat. I don't know. I think it's like a, like a plunger. It's a plunger. <laughs> oh. And the feet. Look at that. The feet sticking out of the... Oh. So you can imagine that, for, again, for the illiterate masses, if they can't access the, the text, the, the actual biblical text themselves, that this was a pretty clear explanation of, uh, you know, be good, be good, uh, go do a pilgrimage, maybe. And uh, oh, this is just another little scene. This is an angel and a, and a demon that engaged in some kind of negotiation, which I think is, is great. One of my favorites. And again, just, just tucking, tucking figures into every little, every little space. <laughs> he is, he is. So again, Caleb, Caleb uh, usurps me whenever I'm about to launch into my lecture on Gothic architecture, about to harangue at him. And he's like, yes, I know, I know, pointy, not roundy. <laughs> pointy, not roundy. So... Um, Again, just to, to give you a bit of context about where this, where Gothic architecture uh, comes from and how it, how it differs from what, what came before, how it differs from the Romanesque, we'll come to uh, the Basilica of Saint Denis. This is in Paris. It's actually a, it, it was a separate little town, but it's, a, it's, it's kind of a suburb now, a northern suburb of uh, Paris. You can, take the, you can take the subway there. You can see it at Saint Denis, it's right at the end of one of the lines. Well worth a, well worth a trip. And this is considered the first Gothic cathedral in the world. Yes, and it was uh, conceived, I mean, I say designed, he's not really an architect, but there was a, an abbot uh, named Abbot uh, Suger, who was based here at, at, at St. Denis. And he, like I said, it's a bit of a stretch to call him a, a, an architect, but he was the kind of the, the conceptualizer, the, the ideas man behind, behind, uh, behind Gothic architecture. This is the, the interior. And Abbot Suger, his, his idea, and it seems obvious to us now, but it hadn't really been conceived of before, but his idea was that light could be a metaphor 
for divine illumination. And we've seen this, I, we, we talked about this in the Caravaggio lecture, that, that artists and architects and sculptors use that idea of light over and over and over again as a metaphor for, for God's grace, for illumination, for spirituality. And, and Sujet believed that if, if he could fill Saint Denis with light, with multicolored, shimmering light, that that would lead people to first contemplate the beauty of that, and then they would contemplate the beauty of, of heaven or the, the transcendent nature of, of, of divinity and the, the sacrifice of, of Christ. He also wanted it to be high. He wanted it to go up. He wanted it to literally point to, point to heaven. So those Roman X churches, they're too squat. And, and again, it wasn't Abbot Sujet, there were, there were uh, architects and, and builders experimenting with this idea, but he was the one who coalesced all of the Gothic ideas into one space. But they designed, for the first time, the, the Goyne Vault. And, and, and how this works is that it's, it kind of, it, there are four pillars and it meets in the, in the center, and then instead of the weight uh, splaying out to the sides, the pressure is forced downward into the pillar. So it's much more of a, a vertical pressure rather than an, an outward splaying effect. So there we are. Look at that groin vault. So those are the, the ribs. You can see them. And then the pressure is coming, is extending down from those ribs, down the columns and, and into the ground. So much, much less of an, of an outward, outward pressure. Which means, too, that because the pressure is forced into the columns, you could have empty spaces, <gasps> which Abbot Sujet thought we can fill it with glass. Wouldn't that be grand? We should make it colored. We should fill it with designs, again, to uh, uh, educate the illiterate masses. And, uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, again, the interior. And the, the, the design of these pointed arches, again, pointed arches, so the Romans, this is something completely new. The Romans weren't interested in pointed arches. But a pointed arch, uh, again, the pressure then goes up and down rather than, than outward. So that's the great innovation of, uh, of, of Gothic architecture. Pointing out round to you people. You'll remember that forever now. <laughs> Yeah, there it is, the groin, the groin vaults here. And then it allows for the columns to be clustered and, and to be far more decorative, so the space starts to be, um, there, there's more elegance to a, to a Gothic cathedral. Also, what Sujet did is that, you remember I mentioned that there were, uh, there were chapels, radiating chapels. This is called the ambulatory, where it comes out around uh, the end of the nave and the altar, and that's where all of the... Um, uh, pilgrims would stop at each individual chapel and and uh, pay homage to the to the relic that was was held there. And Sujet opens up the the ambulatory, so you can see from one. Uh, they're, they're, the spaces are still articulated, so you know you're in a in a, in a distinct chapel. But the light can flow from from one chapel to the next, so it's a, it's an open ambulatory, which again had had, had never been done. This photo is really bad. I took this when I was really young, but it's, it's a little fuzzy. I can see Caleb's not pleased with that, with that photo. I, I don't think. This is not my photo. But, uh, but here it is. Here it again is the, the ambulatory radiating uh, around. So the light from all of the windows inside each chapel are flowing into the, flowing into the nave. It, it just uh, This is a good image, I thought, of the... the pointedness of the, of the arches here. Oh, yes, someone just, I heard someone talking about the tombs. Yeah, the, um, a lot of the early uh, French kings are buried at Saint-Denis. Uh, so, so it's a really interesting, if you're interested more in, um, I mean, go for the art, but if you're, if you're a, a history, buffer history fan, there's also uh, lots of, of tombs of, of really interesting people uh, at Saint-Denis. 
Notice too how, how high uh, he, Abbot Sujet wanted, he wanted it to, to reach up to heaven, to, to, to be literally pointing towards the sky, much higher than Romanesque churches. And he, he uh, again, he didn't invent them, but, but he, he uh, supported the idea of flying buttresses. So, so instead of the buttresses being connected to the building, they're, they're now for the first time separate. So it's allowing windows inside or underneath the buttresses. So they're not, they're not very uh, uh, articulated on, um, on St. Denis. They're much bigger on, uh, on the Notre Dame, which we'll get to in a moment. But you can see them here. I wish I, I did have a stick. Anyway, you can see them there. They are kind of extending outward, and then they come down. And that's supporting, that's supporting the clear story. And the clear story is the, the, upper, the upper level, which is usually filled with windows. And, and this is such a simple idea that you, you would extend. And that would um, also relieve some of the pressure, the pressure kind of pushing down on the, on the walls of the nave. So it'll, like a, it's a, well, buttressing, right? It's supporting, it's supporting the walls, but also allowing for windows. So I'll move on to, to, uh, to the Notre Dame. You'll already be experts, but you'll be pointing out all of the Gothic, the Gothic features. Here, of course, is the, the front facade, the western facade of the, the Notre Dame. There's a, a British art historian named Kenneth Clark, and uh, he, he said, described Notre Dame, the facade of Notre Dame, that it was the most rigorously, in this very posh British accent, said that it was the most rigorous, which I won't imitate, <laughs> said it was the most rigorously intellectual facade in all of Gothic art, rigorously intellectual. I don't know what that means, but anyway, <laughs> it sounds good, Kenneth Clark. I think he means it's very, it's, it's a, there's a, a, a pattern uh, to it, and it is, more rare, the symmetry, and it's more a little more regimented than 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 some of them. Uh, we'll talk more about the facade in a moment, but but I, I'd like to my my argument for why the Notre Dame matters. Uh, there's really three reasons. So there's the, ge the geographic context. Uh, there's the artistic context, which I've been talking about mostly tonight. And then there's also the, the political uh, the, or the, the historical uh, context, which is tied also to the geographical uh, context. But what's special about the Notre Dame, which I think probably all of you know, it's in the, it's in the center of, of Paris, right? Uh, there are better examples. Do I have that in here? Oh, yes. There are better examples of Gothic architecture. So when I'm, when I'm teaching, um, when I'm doing a, a lecture on, on uh, medieval architecture at the university, uh, I usually teach uh, this, this uh, cathedral in Chartres to, to my students because it's a better preserved example. But it's way off in the countryside. Of course it's better preserved, right? It's in a small little town. Um, it's well worth going if you're looking for a day trip outside of Paris. It's about an hour uh, train ride. It's, uh, it's really... It's, it's, it's magnificent, it's an incredible example of, of Gothic architecture, and, and it has a remarkable amount of uh, original features uh, still, still intact. But like I said, of course, of course it is. It's, it's, it's in the middle of a field. Uh, Notre Dame is, is in, the center of, it's in the center of Paris. So the city, the city extends around it. There is, I mean, it's like, it's li literally point zero. It's literally point zero. There's a there's a this round plaque in the front of Notre Dame. So like all of the rows kind of spiral out from or extend out from this point. If you've ever seen a if you've seen a map of Paris, or you can picture the the metro map, it just it, it goes out in, in circles, and, and Notre Dame is at the at the center. And then I mean, you could argue Paris is the center of Western civilization for thousands of years. So it's a, I mean, Notre Dame is, is, is at a fixed, it's at its fixed point. And I think that that's, again, why it holds such a, or, or why, it, why it affected so much of us, uh, or so many of us when, when it was burning 
on, uh, on April 15, because it is, it is, it holds a powerful sway in our collective imagination because of its, uh, because of its geographic location. I think Gombrich does maybe, he's a little more uh, poetic maybe than Kent Clark. I really like this explanation of the facade. So lucid and effortless is the arrangement of the porches. So those are the, the entrances, porches. So lithe and graceful, the tracery of the gallery, that we forget the weight of this pile of stone and the whole structure seems to rise up before us like a mirage. Which is so true. There's something really, like, like I think about the, the Chartres Cathedral. Uh, it's a, like it has a lot of power. It's a very powerful uh, uh, Gothic church. And, but there's a, well, well like Gombrich said, there's a litheness and a, and a, and a delicacy and a, and a weightlessness to the Notre Dame, which I think is really, really special. And he's talking about the, these are the porches here. There's, a, a, yes, like great symmetry and, and rhythm to the porches. And then the elements of the tracery, those are the decorative elements. So we'll look, uh, we'll look quickly at the, at the porches. I thought we could compare uh, the, the one at Conk with the, with the one at Notre Dame. It's, it's so, I mean, the, 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 the decoration here at Notre Dame is so intricate and you can spend uh, an enormous amount of time in like every sculpture, every item is, is, is unique in this, in this sculptural system. So we'll focus on the main, the main, uh, uh, the main portal. And here in the tympanum again is the, the last judgment. It's very predictable. Here it is, the largest figure, Christ, again, the most important. So I'm, pull, I'm pulling in and in here. So here is uh, uh, Christ in majesty once again. And here we have the same scene of the angel and the, de the devil negotiating over the souls. They're weighing the souls. I really like this clutching the shoulder, and he has the the figure, the damned. He's he's heading to hell. This one, and he has him by the head, pushing him down. I personally prefer the sculptural imagination <laughs> at Conk, but that's fine. This is good too. It's more uh, intellectually rigorous, maybe. <laughs> um, but you can see there is more. So this is, the, this is in the space of, um, we're talking about uh, like the, the difference between uh, like uh, 200 years. So, so Conque is built around, uh, around the year 1000. And the Notre Dame is, uh, is, is, is built around the 1200s. I mean, it's, it's extends, but so it's about 200 years difference. And you can really see the, the, the change in the bodies and the, the realism, and there's a, a beginning interest in, in naturalism. So there's, there's more movement to the bodies. Look how, uh, so this is back to, back to Conk again, and that was the, the figure of Peter and the other disciples here. But you can see that they're very, they're very flattened, they're very static. They're contained within their space. There's not a, uh, yeah, they're, they're not moving, right? So they're, they're representations of figures. But in Gothic architecture, in the Gothic sculpture, the figures, they're still, uh, they're still uh, not anatomically correct, but there's, uh, there's a, a, a greater sense of movement. There's a sense of, of weight, that there is an actual body there and they're, they're starting to move their heads too. Why did I well, yeah, <laughs> that's very true. That's Saint Denis. 
Saint Denis had his head uh, had his head cut off. So that's how you. So, so the the Church of Saint Denis with Abbot Suger, that's that's Saint Denis' church. So there's lots of depictions of, of Saint Denis with his with his head cut off. There's also a great sculpture in. If you're in Montmartre ever, there's a there's a, a sculpture of, of Saint Denis and he's holding his head. I think it's in a kids' playground, which I think is very uh, <laughs> morbid. Um, but then also notice too, we saw this with, uh, with the Romanesque uh, church, but then it's even, even more so in, in Gothic spaces that every single space, I mean, look at the, the detailing here just in the base of this column, and then every single niche, every single space is, is filled with some kind of uh, a sculptural design and pattern, and it's just, like, it's endless. It covers the entire surface of the church in and out, so it's... Uh, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's incredible, it's really marvelous, and it's just, just if, you're, if you're passing through the doors, just uh, maybe put your elbows up and, and, and stay there for a few minutes. Well, here's a, the spaces in between. And they would fill the, the uh, Gothic um, era sculptors had great flexibility to fill the in-between spaces with whatever popped into their, their heads. And they're, they're not so much here, but they're always fantastical creatures and, and strange combinations of, of, of animals and humans and, 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 and kind of strange forest creatures. And uh, it, it's, it's really, imaginatively, it's really, really incredible, uh, incredible spaces. Oh, another thing, if you are, if you, if you find yourself in Paris, there is a, uh, there's a museum dedicated to uh, the, the Middle Ages. It's called the, the Cluny Museum, which is the Museum of, museum of the Middle Ages. Uh, skip the Louvre if you only have a limited amount of time. Skip the Louvre. The Louvre will melt your brain and only hurt your feet. But go to the Cluny Museum instead because you'll see all kinds of stuff like this. It's a really lovely, a really lovely museum. You can blame me. Say, Sarah said to skip the loof. <laughs> we can't go in. Oh, yeah, skip it. This is the, the rose window on the, the western facade. This is the front facade. And, and rose windows, I mean, it's basically just a, it's a round window, and it becomes very popular in the Gothic era. They become larger and larger, which we'll see. But the, the, the rose window on the western facade is the, is the oldest, so 12, 12, 25, like early 1200s. This is the interior. You can't see it. It's the least popular one because it's the smallest, and it's tucked in behind the, the organ. But it's often filled with, with there, there's some kind of a narrative, right? Again, that you can read the story, the Christian narrative within the glass. The, there had always been, see, coming back to this, it looks so tiny, eh? There, there had always been little round windows in Romanesque churches, but it just gets larger and larger and larger. And it feels like sometimes in, in uh, Gothic churches, it's like, it's like the walls themselves, there's so much glass, and they've perfected the, the groin vault and, and perfected um, the, the, the design of the flying buttresses that the walls are so filled with glass that the, the walls feel like they're translucent, like they're looking through this kind of shimmering, yeah, glowing kind of blue and purple, and it's, uh, it's really, really a, a feat of, of engineering. The one on the south side, the rose window on the south side is the, is the big one. It's the, it's the star of, of the Notre Dame, and I think probably one of the, the best elements here. So this is the rose window. It's, uh, oh, 17 meters. It's enormous. It's enormous. Yeah. This is the, the interior, looking at the rose window. 80-some panels. And what I said about Chartres Cathedral being a, a better preserved example of Gothic architecture, a lot of the original stained glass remains at Chartres Cathedral. Uh, here at, at Notre Dame, all, all of these, the, very few of these panels are original to the Middle Ages. Uh, they've, uh, there was a fire. Oh yeah, here we go. There was a, 
uh, an archbishop, the, the archbishop's residence was, was next to the cathedral. And in one of the French revolutions, they set fire to the, to the bishop's residence. And, and in the fire, the, the rose window was quite severely damaged. And, uh, and then it was replaced, oh, with they, someone came along in the 1800s, thought it'd be much better if it was replaced with clear glass. Wouldn't clear glass be better? And clear, anyway, but it's, uh, it's all kind of back to its original design. But, but very, it's, 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 it's not the original glass, right? I mean, it doesn't diminish, again, like it's, it's still, the concept is, is still there, but, uh, but again, if you're looking for the kind of the originality, if you want to see medieval stained glass, probably Chartres Cathedral would be better, a better choice. But whatever, it's still great. And the rose windows were, were saved, of course. There's a little bit of damage, uh, I believe, to, to uh, some of them, but they're, they're, uh, they're largely, largely intact. I'm not going to talk a lot about the fire tonight and like what survived and what didn't, but um, it was a triumph for the rose, the rose windows. <laughs> Look at those flying buttresses. <laughs> so, so this is a, a good photo, I think, to show you. These are, of course, the, the bell towers. And here are the original flying buttresses that were built in the, in the 1200s. The larger flying buttresses uh, around the, the, the altar and the, the ambulatory were, were added um, slightly later, not, not much later, but slightly later, which allows for this great height within the, within the church in the interior. Ribbed vault. Again, shooting, so the, the weight from that ceiling is shooting down the columns here, which allows for these massive windows in the clear story. Here's the, the interior, which I'm sure most of you have, of you have seen. Pointy, not roundy. <laughs> The pointed, the pointed arches here, and the and the groin vault, of course. And it is a really special space. I think there's something really. Oh, I love going to church services in in Gothic cathedrals, and they're. Um, the, there's something really, really incredible about them that I think uh, uh, gets lost over the, the, the course of the Renaissance or the, or the Baroque. I mean, I've, I've talked about Baroque churches in these lectures before, and, and, and they're special also when they hammer you over the head with the amount of, of gold that, <laughs> that they have. But I don't know, there's something really, uh, really profound and really, uh, uh, really special about, about uh, these, these Gothic spaces, which I think uh, Abbot Suget articulated, he understood that, that, that the space in which one uh, prayed could, could convey one's thoughts to a, to a higher plane. And then again, that spirituality could be manifested in a, in a metaphorical way within, within the architecture. So here's a, here are the flying buttresses. Again, a lot of the gargoyles, I won't talk a lot about the gargoyles, they were added uh, most of them were added in the 19th century. So yeah, they're, they're not all original to, to the Gothic period. And this, these are the, the, the flying buttresses. They span about, um, they come out from the building about 15 meters. So they're, they're, they're some of the, the, the widest uh, flying buttresses that I can, I can think of. And I think they look really, really elegant. And then interestingly, I mean, art, art is always this kind of a, a cyclical or there's, there's, there's this pendulum kind of motion in, in art history. The period that comes after the Middle Ages, the period that comes after the, the, the Gothic era is, uh, is the Renaissance, of course, and they're rediscovering uh, the design of, 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 of antiquity and the ideas of, of Greek, uh, Greece and Rome. And they hate everything about the Gothic. No flying buttresses when they're designing. I'll have to do something about this. But when they're designing um, the, the dome in Florence for the, for the great uh, Florence Cathedral, the Duomo, 
they had, there, there were a few stipulations, no, no flying buttresses, the French did that, and, uh, and no spires, so nothing pointy. They wanted roundy, not pointy. <laughs> so it's just, just back and forth and back and back and forth. I like them though, I think they're great. So this is the, this is the eastern side, so this is the, the rear of the, of the church. I really like this, this view. And uh, just another thing to note as well, that that spire, the spire that, that, that famously burned, and we came, anyway, I won't talk about the fire too much, but uh, that, that is not a Gothic feature. That was added a few centuries later. Let's put the, the flying buttresses again here. And then to, so, so, so that's the, the, the artistic context. It's a great, really lovely, transcendent example of Gothic architecture. But historically, the, the Notre Dame has, has been witness to uh, so much French, uh, Parisian and, and French history, world history. Stuff has happened, stuff. Uh, important historical events have happened on its literal uh, doorstep There was a, uh, oh, France, well, there's so many, you know, it's, it's a bloody history. France has a rather bloody history. But uh, one bloody spot in particular uh, was the, the religious wars in the 1500s. And uh, there was a, a conflict, there was conflict between the Protestants and the, the Catholics, as always. And uh, the, there was a, a Huguenot king, so a Protestant king, Henry the Fourth. Anyway, a Henry. It was a Henry, and he thought it would be a great idea if we could we could unite the the Protestants and the Catholics by the age-old method of marrying into them. So he he finds a, he finds a Catholic, a nice Catholic girl, uh, Marguerite de Valois, and uh, and he marries her on the doorstep of Notre Dame in uh, 1572, the 1500s, late 1500s. Uh, he doesn't go in, he's a Protestant, he's gonna stand outside, not gonna go in, but <laughs> it is symbolic. <laughs> and everyone thought that was grand, all right, the two sides are getting together. And then all kinds of Protestants uh, descended on, on Paris for the wedding, to celebrate the wedding of, of the Protestant king and the, and the new Catholic queen and the Parisians slaughtered them all. <laughs> in St. Bartholomew's Day's massacre, the Seine, the river here, ran red with blood for miles to the next, oh, anyway, it was horrific. But it was so long ago, we can laugh about it. So. Uh, in the, uh, uh, in, in, uh, the, the 1700s, so the, where do I start with this story? Uh, this, so um, the Enlightenment, the age of the Enlightenment, 1700s, it was really hard. It was really hard on the church. Uh, the revolution, the French Revolution, was also hard on the church. Uh, all of these uh, religious imagery was in poor taste. It didn't fit with the, with the, with the ideas of the Enlightenment and the, and the French Revolution. Uh, rioters uh, decapitated. They thought that these were uh, figures of kings, but they're actually uh, figures of saints. But they thought they were figures of kings, and, and they chopped their heads off. So the figures were decapitated, these sculptures, for, for a number of years. Uh, they declared that it was no longer uh, the Notre Dame Cathedral, that that the cathedral would now be, this is during the French Revolution, that would be now known as the Temple of Reason. It's the Temple of Reason in the Enlightenment. It sounds like a terrible, well, I mean, obviously, lots of people were dying, but, you know, for other reasons, the Temple of Reason. And, of course, nobody wanted to go to the Temple of Reason. That sounds really boring. So they canceled services, and in the 1700s, they started uh, using the Notre Dame Cathedral as food storage which is a tragedy. But Napoleon fixed everything, thanks to Napoleon. Here he is at his coronation. Well, no, the, sorry, this is the coronation of, of uh, Josephine, uh, or the crowning of Josephine. But anyway, whatever, Napoleon's here. And this is inside uh, Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. 
Pope Pius comes from Rome, again, uh, signifying the, the importance of Notre Dame. And, and Napoleon restores it back to not the Temple of Reason. Uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's heavily, heavily damaged during the, the French Revolution. It's not, uh, it's not a popular building. It kind of falls into to, to a state of disrepair. No one, no one cares about it for, for a long time until the pendulum swings back the other way out of, uh, out of the Age of Enlightenment into Romanticism. And the Romantics love the idea of the Gothic. Isn't the Gothic grand? And then also, Victor Hugo writes The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1831. Did I have something else to tell you? Wait, did I have some other story? I think I'm forgetting something. They melted down the bells. That was the other thing I had to tell you <laughs> in the Enlightenment. Like, we're going to melt those down and use them for something much more reasonable than bell tolling. Ugh. Okay, back to, back to Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo uh, it was published in France under the title uh, The Notre Dame de Paris, sort of not in, in English, the, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. 1831, and Victor Hugo single-handedly, I think, single-handedly saves, saves the Notre Dame. Uh, and and he, he wrote uh, uh, several uh, treatises or papers on the importance of Gothic architecture and, and saving Gothic architecture. And, and you all probably know, probably know the story of, uh, of the, the hunchback who lives, who lives within the, the, the bell towers, within the space, uh, the upper tiers of the Notre Dame. And, and there's, uh, they, they launch into a massive restoration campaign over the uh, 15, or no, sorry, 15, 18, 1840s to 1860s, and they restore the Notre Dame to its, uh, to its former glory. And, uh, and so, so, of course, you, you've all seen images that the, most of the, the roof has been lost and, and that, that wooden spire is gone. But, but I think importantly that the, the main features, the main Gothic features of, of the structure remain intact. The, the bell towers were saved, of course. They pulled the relics and, and, and the important uh, art objects out of the, the space. The bees were saved, there are bees yes. right? <laughs> on the roof. And all the bees survived. It's a triumph. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and again, you, you, you know that there's been a, 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 an outpouring of, of, uh, of money and support, so they're, they're embarking on a, on, a, on a construction campaign. But this is just, we think of these, these, these structures now, or these art objects, as being that they're immutable, that they're, they're fixed, that they're kind of um, museums, right? That they're, they're, they have to be perfectly preserved. But I think what's, what the history of Notre Dame has shown, like, things get added. It's a living, it's a living thing. It's a living structure. And, and yeah, I mean, windows have been blown out and replaced, and they've stuck a bunch of gargoyles around the side over the centuries, and they added a spire. They thought that would look great. And, you know, things, they've melted down the bells. They're not the original bells. So it's, it's, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a perfectly frozen-in-time monument. And this is, I think, just one of the steps. This, this fire is one of the steps in this, this kind of... Uh, storied past or this this storied narrative of, of this this great structure and i'm sure it'll i'm sure it'll be fine so grand that's it <laughs>